The name Tuba is mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah al rad verse 29 as follows. Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul kulub. Those who believe and whose hearts find satisfaction in the remembrance of Allah fall without doubt in the remembrance of Allah. Do hearts find satisfaction? Al-Ladheena amanu wa amilu salihati tuba lahum wa khusnu ma'ab. For those who believe and work righteousness is every blessedness and a beautiful place of final return. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ما شاء الله ما شاء الله great to see all of these faces alhamdulillah this is a good sign a sign of a strong community a sign of a pious community coming to the masajid worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is beautiful it's a beautiful sign before i start my presentation i have been told to introduce the general theme of today's event and today's event is about protecting your heart building that fortress to withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune as shakespeare said i think it was the words of hamlet the outrageous fortune of the new religions of today atheism liberalism nihilism postmodernism secularism and all the other isms and schisms that are trying to permeate our hearts and mind but when we have iman when we love allah when we have in it's going to smash these ideologies yes correct good takbir that was loud enough takbir takbir masha allah tabarakallah so i like to thank sheikh owais for almost single handedly arranging the south africa tour with his organization which is called al manar al i forgot the name now merkez manal manar al fikr yes i do apologize sheikh because it's a new organization so remember that name i have to memorize it as well because it's going to be present in south africa inshallah all over south africa to engage with the youth and with the mashayikh 
so we're able to build that fortress against all of these ideologies. Now, let me tell you a little story. I've been involved in Dao for around, you could say almost 20 years. I've been Muslim for almost 21 years. And I've had an interesting journey where I had to make a lot of mistakes because we didn't have the kind of social structures in place, especially in the UK at that time, that would facilitate one's journey in the most optimal way. Now, alhamdulillah, we have mashayikh, we have institutions, we have social media, we have du'at. And throughout that journey, I have to admit to you that it, it was difficult from the point of view of my internal spiritual state. And I was many times affected in some way by the shubuhat, the destructive doubts. And alhamdulillah, they didn't enter my heart, but they were sitting on there and they were latching on trying to drain my iman. And that's the nature of a shubha. It's like a parasite. And people take it seriously because it resembles something that it's not. Tushbihu, to resemble something that it's not. It's trying to resemble something. And this is why the famous scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, he made a very astute point. He said the reason many people adopt these untrue worldviews and religions because there is a tinge of truth, but it's based on a falsehood. It's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's the nature of all shubuhat. That's the nature of all destructive doubts. So when I was dealing with atheism and dealing with other isms, sometimes there'll be some problems inside me. And I realized that at the end of the day, the number one issue of why that was occurring is not because Shubahat had any intellectual foundation. It was because of me. There was something wrong within myself. Because the nature of a Shubha is that it attacks the heart, the Qalb. And the Qalb in the Islamic tradition is the locus and the focus of the human. And the Qalb does Taqallub, it wavers Qalaba, to boil over, to waver. But the, the Qalb also has fitan, tribulations, trials, shubuhat and shahawat, destructive doubts and blameworthy desires. But it also has diseases like kibr, arrogance, ujub, self-amazement, vanity, riya, ostentation and hasad, blameworthy jealousy. So think about this model. You have the Qalb, it does taqallub. And remember, we need to keep the heart firm on Iman. It must be sound. As Allah says in the Quran, that you're not going to be safe on the day of judgment unless you come to Allah with Qalbin Salim, with a sound heart. But it gets diseased and it has tribulations and it wavers. And the aql, the intellect, according to the majority of the ulama, is a function of the Qalb. So the issue is not necessarily an intellectual one. Because the aql is a function of the qalb and it wavers and it's diseased and it has fitan. So what one needs to do, or the main thing one needs to do is ensure that the spiritual heart is sound. And my spiritual heart wasn't sound. I remember talking to an apostate, I believe, or someone who had huge doubts. I gave him a really good answer. Alhamdulillah. He came, he came back to the deen. But I wasn't convinced with the answer. I wasn't really happy with it, but it worked. And after maybe a year, I think it was Adnan Rashid, may Allah bless him, who started Adnan, does great work in Africa and, and in Europe and all around the world, on an intellectual, and social and village, everything. May Allah bless him and his family. Say, I mean. And he gave me an answer, which was exactly the same, I believe. And I was like, wow, my heart was like, you know, and this has happened many times and I found that there was a correlation. Correlation had nothing to do with my intellectual capacity. The correlation had nothing to do with the state of my aql, my intellect. The correlation even didn't have to do with my ilm. Although it was limited and it's still limited and it needs to continue. But it was to do with my state of being, my heart. The sunnas were hardly there. My relationship with Allah was hanging on a, hanging on a thin thread. And I realized that the closer I was with Allah, when I did the afghar in the morning and the evening, the du'as, when I was praying the sunnah, when I was reflecting on Allah's names and attributes, trying to internalize them in my life, actualize them in my life, everything changed. Everything changed. So I want to focus on one small solution on how to strengthen your heart 
So it becomes a fortress against these evil ideologies. And this is on focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fact that we must love Allah. We must love Allah. And there are many reasons why we should love Allah. But one thing I want to focus on is when we think about ibadah, we think about worship, we have to understand that entails many things. And yes, there is kind of differences of understanding or slight subtleties in the classical tradition concerning ibadah, but generally speaking, it entails something. It entails to know Allah, to recognize Him as the ultimate truth. It entails to love Allah. It entails to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which includes being submissive to Him, to be humble towards Him, and also to have positive fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also includes to sing aloud and direct all internal and external acts of worship to Allah alone. The actions of the heart and the actions of the limbs. This is worship. And the key part of worship is to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many reasons why we must love Allah. The first thing we need to think about is who is Allah with regards to the concept of love? Who knows Allah's name referring to love? Everyone should know this. Put your hand up. Al Wadud. Coming from the word wood, which means in Arabic a, a, a love that is giving. Giving. Allah is the most loving. And it's interestingly, it relates to this word wood because love is really an expression. Love is an action. Even Eric from the psychoanalyst in his book, The Art of Loving, he makes a really clear point. He said, love is actually a sense of giving. It's a way of being. It's an action. You even have the famous book, The Five Love Languages, which are literally manifested in the real world. Words of affirmation, touch, quality time. My favorite love language is touch and quality time. Yeah. And maybe acts of service, but depends who does it. So, <laughs> so the point is, these things are actions. Only in a kind of distorted ideology like liberalism, postmodernism, they just focus on the feeling itself. It's like they castrate love. They make it to this just feeling. And he doesn't really manifest itself. That's why you hear people saying, but I love her really. Like he would cheat, he would beat her up, he would do this and the other. But then he would say, but I still love her. I love her really. So love is giving. Love is an action. Love is a way of being. Love is a behavior. Love is a behavior. So when we focus on Allah's names and attributes, we know in the Islamic tradition, Allah's names and attributes are perfect. Meaning they have no deficiency and no flaw. They are to the highest degree possible. Allah is the most loving. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that Allah has more affection for you than a mother has for her young ones. Now think about this. Let's be very honest with this. And I was trying to understand what this means and how we can reconcile it with a mother's love and divine love. And if you think about it, in general, a mother's love is the highest form of love in the dunya. Yes or no? No one's going to love you more than your mother. And a mother's love is sacrificial. Allah loves you and has more affection for you than your own mother. Think about it. Our mothers, their love is a contingent love. They need to love. It completes them. They have a conflict of interest. And really, our mothers don't know ultimately what's good for us sometimes. They have this sense of possessive ishq love. Like my mom. She won't see in the next month. She'll be like, I'm loving you right now. You have to do this right now. But even hard love is very difficult for mothers, yeah? Like, especially if you come from a Greek culture, and I think it's similar with Egyptian culture. Like, you know, it's you get cute rage. Google it. Cute rage is a thing. Like your teeth go fuzzy, you want to bite it, you want to kill it. Your soul, I love you so much, I'm going to throw you down the stairs. Yeah, you're so cute. I want to throw you against the wall. I want to splatter you. Yeah, although we don't want to do that, but it's an expressive way. It's mobile. It's like a, it's like a hyperbolic way of expressing one's love. Yeah. Where was I? Yes, a mother needs love. She it completes her. It. She's contingent. She's dependent. She needs completion, and her love completes her. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as-samad. He is the independent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is complete. He doesn't require any completion. Yet his, his, he loves and his love is the highest form of love, the most purest form of love. And he gains nothing by loving, yet he loves. Imagine how beautiful that love is. And this is why we need to taste that love. We have to, anyone with a qalb would want to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah says in the Quran, say, talking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to the Arabs who felt that they loved Allah, if you love Allah, then follow me, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Allah will love you and forgive your sins. So a pathway to divine love is through following and obeying and loving Habibullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could you not love the beloved of the loving? This is enough for me. I don't even need to read the seerah. Although we do. But I'm saying, this is an emphatic point to show you. If Allah loves the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is enough for me. Allah is the source of love. He's the most loving and he loves Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khalas, that's enough. And imagine when you do read the seerah. Imagine when you do learn his characteristics and you start to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even more. This is why we love the Prophet sallallahu even more than our mothers. This is part of our aqidah. So Allah is the most loving. And therefore, we must love Allah because of the purity of His love and the maximal, maximum, the maximal nature of His love. But let me give you some reasons, other reasons why we should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reason number one. And a lot of this has been taken from Al-Ghazali. In his Ihya, he has a section of his corpus that talks about muhabba, love of Allah, uns, intimacy, and contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he provides like five reasons of loving Allah. So one of these reasons include self-love. Yes, he says, if you love yourself, you have to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? But what kind of self-love is he talking about? He's not talking about a form of narcissism. You know, you project your ego on the whole world and you don't end up loving anyone apart from yourself. You just love projections of yourself. No, a self-love is a mature love that you want goodness for yourself. You want guidance for yourself. You want well-being. And this echoes even Eric Fromm, what he said about self-love and mature self-love. There's nothing wrong with self-love in terms of you wanting good for yourself. This is why we want to go Jannah. Why do you want to go Jannah? Because it's painful? No, you want to go Jannah because it's bliss. So you want goodness for yourself, guidance for yourself. And Al-Ghazali basically makes an argument, well, if you want goodness and guidance for yourself, then who is the source of that goodness and guidance? Who created the asbab? Who created the physical causes in the universe that you manipulate and bring together in order to have goodness and well-being? Who's the one who guides you? And he argues that if you don't love Allah after loving yourself, because it should lead to divine love, then you're in a state of like almost ghafla, heedlessness. You're disillusioned with the dunya. So self-love must lead to divine love. Because who is the source of your well-being? Who is the source of your guidance? Who created the physical causes in the universe for you to use to actually have well-being? Who guides you? Who is the source of love? How can you not love the source of love? Think about it. How can you not have an affinity for the one who created love in the first place? So that's the first main reason. Second reason is that Allah is the greatest benefactor. And Al-Ghazali argues that when people do good for you, they give you gifts, you start to have an affinity for them. Love this guy. He's so nice to me. He's at service to me. He praises me. He protects me. He does so many good things for me. He gives me gifts. He's there for me. That actually evokes and develops love between brothers. Correct? And you start to have an affinity for them. And that affinity is a loving affinity. Al-Ghazali argues, let's not be deluded here. Let's have some shame. How can we love all of these benefactors? But in reality, 
The only way that we're able to benefit us is because of Allah Himself. Allah is al barr He is the source of all goodness. He is the greatest benefactor. How can you love your friend who does so many things for you, and this person does so many things for you, and even your wife who does so many things for you, and then you deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is a Quranic way of thinking, linking everything back to the source, everything back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must love Allah because He is the greatest benefactor. All of these benefits that we gain, all of these amazing things that we receive, all of the praise, the service, the gifts, the love, all of the acts of service, all of the intimacy that we achieve and acquire through halal means is all from Allah. As a result of Allah and because of Allah. So if you love them, surely you must love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is the greatest benefactor. Another argument Al Ghazali makes is we should love Allah not because He benefit, benefits us, because He benefits other people too, which is a very interesting argument. It's similar to the argument I've just made, but we're not, we're not recipients of these benefits. And how does he argue this? He says, you know, when you hear of someone who does a great work, it doesn't really directly benefit you in any way. He does great work. You think, oh, he's such an amazing person. Like, say you hear of a king, a benevolent king. He takes care of his people. He gives gifts to his people. He takes care of his people. He protects his people. He loves his people. He honors his people. He elevates his people. He educates his people. He heals his people. You're like, wow, what an amazing king. I love this king. I have an affinity for this king. Al Ghazali says, by greater reason, then you must love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you hear amazing stories of what happens in the universe. You hear amazing stories of what happens all around the world. Even to your family friends or to your brothers, especially if you truly love your brothers, not just biological brothers, but your brothers in Islam or your sisters in Islam and your true brothers that you want good for them and you don't have blameworthy jealousy, you don't have hasad, that you want it to, to be taken away, you want it to increase because you love them, you're so happy because you're like, wow, look at Allah. You know, when you see a brother who, you know, he's extremely articulate, handsome, strong, built like a tank, six foot seven, who are we talking about here? <laughs> Wallahi, I love it. This is Allah has expressed His love. And it's true. That's how we should be with our brothers. Wallahi, this should be lessons. You know, it was difficult for me in the beginning, many, many years ago, when I was managing Aira. And I used to make dua in sajda. I say, oh Allah, make them better than me. Oh Allah, do this. Oh Allah, do that. Because I knew I have enough. But I didn't identify myself with those blameworthy traits of the nafs. I jumped out of myself and I tried to say no. I'm like, you're not going to identify yourself with this mess. This is a lowly attitude. You're trying to compete. You think you're better. Shut your mouth. You're finished, Hamza. <laughs> you're finished. You're enough. You're finished. Right? We should do ego side. Yeah? Not genocide. Ego side. We should kill the ego. So when you see Allah's love being manifested in the brothers and to the sisters and to families and to so many people, like we just came from an amazing house. May Allah bless that family. It's a beautiful house, beautiful family, beautiful food, beautiful hospitality. This is like a manifestation, a manifestation of Allah's goodness and His guidance and His rahmah and His love. And you should think, subhanAllah, what a great benevolent king. Allah is the king of all kings. The greatest king, the benevolent, the merciful, the loving. So Al Ghazali argues, therefore, you should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another reason for love, and this is not generally speaking Al Ghazali's argument, but it's connected to his other discourses, is the fact that when something fulfills you, something completes you, you end up loving it. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, there is a hole in everybody's heart. This is a metaphorical argument, okay? Everyone has a hole. You can fill that hole with a wife, or two wives, or three, or four. Or follow the sunnah of the Cape Town brothers, only one, with skin. <laughs> 
May Allah guide all of you. <laughs> we need to create a revolution. <laughs> you know? Allahu Akbar. We're talking about love here. And the thing is, Muslim men, to prove that we came from the loving, we should be able to love more than one. Yeah, that's a good spiritual argument for you. Yeah, yeah, you know, my beloved wife is, is part of your tarbiyah. Just you know that, you know, Allah is the loving and it's manifested in my life. <laughs> anyway, moving along. Everyone has a heart you, and a hole in their heart. And you could fill it with the dunya. You could fill it with maybe drugs or smoking or alcohol or having fun or all of these silly things. And Wallahi, it's always going to reappear. Always going to reappear. Always going to re reappear. And we know this. And this is very seriously, jokes aside, if I gave you one billion rand today, how would you feel? Tell me how would you feel? Just happy, yeah? D elated. There's no words to describe how you're going to feel. There's no words. You'd be like in a state of silent shock. Right? Like Muhammad Hijab was in the debate the other day in Joburg when the atheist was saying something so stupid, Hijab was like, honestly, you could put like five cucumbers in his mouth after that. <laughs> You know, the, the people were skiing. They were ideologically molested. <laughs> uh, subhanAllah. So, this is a serious point. Okay, let me change the example now. If I give you a billion rands tonight, and I told you tomorrow morning you have to lose your iman for life, would you take the billion pounds? Such is the gift of iman. It completes us. It makes us. Honestly, if you don't have Iman, you're worse than an animal. When you have a penny it runs out of ink, what do you do? You throw it away. Because it's not fulfilling its function and its purpose. Allah completes us and things that complete us we have an affinity for and we love. And the way Allah completes us by connecting to Him is the greatest form of completion to the point that you'd reject a billion rounds. Another argument from Al-Ghazali is the fact that we love beauty. Hijab was saying, look at the sunset. We're in that house, the sunset was beautiful. If your fitra is not too clouded, you're going to appreciate natural beauty. You're going to appreciate these things. We love beautiful things. Men, we love beautiful women. We lower our gaze if they're not our wives, of course. But we love beautiful things. We love beautiful nature, the mountains, the stars. I remember when I went to North Wales in England, and it was in the summer, we were camping with the family, we were praying Fajr, and usually when it's Fajr, it's still dark when you leave the campsite or you leave the, uh, the, the tent. And I finished Fajr, and I just walked out. And you know what I did? I just looked up, and I saw layers of layers and layers of stars. I actually choked. Like, it's easy for me to cry, but not all the time. Not when I look at nature, because I'm a Westerner. I'm from towns. I'm from London. And we don't really have that connection to nature. But something happened within me. I, it totally really made me choke. And I was like, subhanAllah. And you know there is a correlation between atheism and people living in towns and, and light pollution. Because they don't have the opportunity to see the stars. It, modernity has corrupted the fitra of man. And this is an interesting point because there are studies to show that reflecting on nature, pondering upon natural beauty, increases one's awe. And when your awe is increased, your cognition, your cognitive faculties are increased and you become more humble. Which is very interesting concerning the hadith on kibr. When the Prophet was talking about if you have like an atom's weight or a or, or a small portion of kibbutz in one's heart that you will not go to paradise. And what does the Sahabi say? But I love beautiful clothes, nice clothes. And the Prophet says, this is not basically kibbutz. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. And a manifestation of Allah's beauty is the natural world. And when you reflect upon the natural world, what does it do? It lowers your ego, increases your cognition, lowers your humility because you're in a state of awe. This is done not religious studies. This is studies done by academics. And we know Allah is beautiful. Not only from the point of view understanding that His beauty is most perfect, 
Because we believe, yes, there is subjective beauty, but there is an objective beauty. You can't say ontologically the source or nature of beauty is subjective. Because the, Allah is not subjective. His beauty is objective. And His beauty is manifested in the cosmos. And when we reflect on it properly, we understand how beautiful Allah is. And Al-Ghazali argues, everybody loves beautiful things. But what about the one who's the most beautiful? What about the one who is the source of all beauty? That is the Quranic way of thinking, linking everything back to Allah. Think about this. That's why you should go and explore, go to the savannah, go to these places, look at the sunset, look at the animals. Just reflect. In actual, don't even think too hard. Just allow the fitrah to work itself and something would happen to you. So Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. And Al-Ghazali argues we have an affinity to love beauty. So we must love the one who is the source of beauty and the most beautiful. Final point in the last two minutes. I just want to add one other reasons why we should love Allah and therefore worship Allah is to think about going back to the beginning, making it full circle, that Allah's love is the most perfect form of love. You know, who likes martial arts here? Put your hand up. Who's your favorite martial artist? Khabib. Khabib. Now, when Khabib got McChicken to tap out, I, was, I remember I was with my daughter on an EasyJet flight, just about to go to Paris for a Dawa thing, and I brought my daughter with me, yeah? And we were just about to fly, and I was watching on my phone, and he tapped, yeah? And I was like, oh my God, I was like elated. I was like, oh my God, right? I was on the plane, I couldn't say, Takbir, yeah? <laughs> I'm not going in big trouble. But I was like elated. He's like, you know, you get that feeling. Who likes poetry here? Who's your favorite poet? <laughs> My wife. <laughs> I like Iqbal, the poet of the East, when he said, for the disbeliever, he's lost in the cosmos. But for the believer, the cosmos is lost in him. This one prostration that you find so difficult frees you from a thousand prostrations. And he also said, I heard from a white man once, a system of governance that counts man but doesn't weigh him. Democracy, hypocrisy, yeah? Anyway, so he had amazing poetry, right? And look, we would praise him and we would be in awe of his poetry, his eloquence and his conciseness. Who likes soccer here? Put your hand up. Who's your favorite football player, soccer player? Who? Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano, Cristiano, Cristi, Ronaldo. When you see him score, he does really high headers. He's amazing. His athletic skill, his, his shooting abilities, his football skill. You're in awe of him. You're like, wow, yes, amazing. Something happens in our heart and we're compelled to praise things with certain attributes. And those attributes don't directly benefit us in any way. And they're not totally perfect. They have some flaw, yet we're compelled to praise them. Imagine how we must praise Allah because of His perfect love. If we could praise things that are imperfect, that don't directly benefit us in any way, then what does it mean about praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose names and attributes are to the highest degree possible without any deficiency and flaw? This is why we say, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than anything we can imagine, and so is His love. One way of protecting your heart is by falling in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I truly believe if your children have fallen in love with Allah, no matter what happens in their life, they'll come back. So let's make this love part of our communities. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm looking. I'm looking at the screen and I can see my back. What's going on here? <laughs> this is the view my wife likes to see. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, guys, look, I mean...
First of all, I want to spend some time thanking people. Always, Paulana always has been fantastic in organizing this event. I mean, I, I really have to commend him for his hospitality, his integrity, his dignity, and his ability uh, in being able to organize this particular event in Johannesburg and Pretoria and now in Cape Town as well. I want to thank uh, Maulana Ashraf, who's just very kindly taken us to his house and fed us very nicely. Uh, there's more to thank, I know, mashallah, you know, but I just want to thank also Riaz because he's been driving us everywhere uh, today and yesterday. Uh, in fact, I had a conversation with him, um, which is a very, very enlightening conversation because when I speak to South Africans, I always find out new things, it's like unbelievable things. And he goes to the savannah and he goes into hunting and these kind of things. And he said to me, look, um, I said to him, what are the principles of hunting and these kind of things? And what have you seen? I've seen an elephant. For me, it's an unbelievable thing. Like to see an elephant in the street is like unheard of thing. You know, I, I was like, what, what, what do you do? Like if you see a lion, if you see an elephant, if you see a hippopotamus. And, and I was like looking at the videos and stuff like this and looking at how the hippopotamus is moving at the, uh, the lion and the lion is running away and this and that. I said, well, if, say, for example, if I see a lion, uh, what do I do? What? He said, look, I mean, first of all, you don't run away because they will catch you. They're faster than okay. I said, OK, no problem. And then he said something else. I said, and this is the same thing someone said to me when I went to Canada one day. I said, what do I do when I see a bear? He said, if you see a specific kind of bear, fight him. I was like, what are you saying, Fifth? <laughs> what do you mean fight him? Like, what do you mean? Like, he said, make loud noises and, and go for him. Show him the confidence. I said, are you being serious? He said, yes. He said, you're likely to drive him away. I said, I'm not an expert in these things. Maybe I thought this guy wanted me dead. I thought he was one of the enemies of Islam. <laughs> You know, he's, he's just saying this. So I went online and checked it up and stuff like that. And it turned out this is actually a theory that you make noises and loud things and things like that together. And I thought, this is subhanAllah how confidence works. Now, this is what I want to talk about today, confidence. Because I've spoken about arguments for a very long time. Okay. I've spoken about arguments. And we have very, many videos talking about liberalism and feminism and the LGBT ideology and all these kinds of things, and you can find them online. But if they are not delivered in a confident manner, they may as well not be delivered, which leads me to my point. In South Africa, in the West, the Muslim community, one thing that will save it is the same thing that would save it if the lion came in front of it, is confidence. Don't show the colonizer your back. Don't run away from the colonizer. Your strongest start chance of survival is in fighting the bear itself. If you consider how Islam spread in the first instance, how Islam proliferated, how Islam went from Arabs in the desert to the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, it was nothing but pure, unadulterated confidence. It doesn't mean you have to be a brash figure. Now, this is what people don't understand. And I want to make this very clear. People look at individuals like Andrew Tate and they say, this is what confidence looks like. That's what extroversion looks like. Now, I'm an extroverted character. There's a difference between confidence and extroversion. You can be a humble guy. You're talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. Look at Messi, for example. He's an introvert, but he's a beast when he's on the football pitch. You don't have to have an extroverted temperament to be confident. Confidence means doing something with the ability or the belief in the ability to do so. Our belief should come from Tawheed, undoubtedly. And connected to this is the idea of Tawakkul, or reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the character of Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. If you look at the character of Abu Bakr Siddiq, really his temperament wasn't extroverted, it wasn't brash, it wasn't over like this. It, but he was more confident than even Umar ibn Khattab, 100%. He was more brave than Umar ibn Khattab. And he was better in, in general than Umar ibn Khattab by the consensus of the Muslims. Yes, he was. Because he was, after all of the NBA, the greatest man who ever lived. Allahuwa Abu Bakr Siddiq. After the Isra al Ma'raj took place, people were leaving Islam. So you say, look what your prophet is saying. He's saying that he went to the sky and he went there and he went there. What kind of thing is this? He said. And some people actually left Islam because they said, this is, what kind of claim is this? They went to Abu Bakr and they said to him, what do you think of this situation? 
They thought he would be faltering because of it. He would be phased. He said, "In qalaha faqad sadaq." If he said it, then it's definitely true. He had 100% confidence in the religion of Islam and Tawheed and had to work with. Now we need to have this. Now I want to reiterate a point. Confidence does not mean extroversion. Because if you connect it to the idea of extroversion, it's ajub actually. Which is, I have to be honest with you and say, is a disease I have in myself. Ajub is vanity. Or the idea of self-amazement. Now it is different. Like Ghazali mentioned... <laughs> No, I have to, because the reason why the scholars of the past used to say, tell the people of your weaknesses so they don't copy them. I'm not going to mention Andrew Tate and attack him and say, this guy is completely a narcissist and this and that. Because really, who isn't? Uh, yani, I'm worse, I believe, you know. I'm a Muslim, I've been Muslim for many years, not just a new Muslim. And I have these traits and I want to tell you about them. There's a difference between ajab and takabbur. Ajab is when you think, when you, when you think more of yourself than you th should think. Basically, you don't need an object like Al Ghazali mentions takabur. Is you have to have subject and object. You have to have another person that you think you're better than. Alhamdulillah, I don't think I'm better than anyone, honestly. But sometimes I look at myself in the mirror. I mean, there have been times I've been late for engagements. Sometimes I talk to myself. <laughs> I'm driving the car and I say, oh, you've really done it, haven't you? You should see some of the conversations I have with my wife. If someone was, if someone witnessed those conversations, they'd think this guy's a madman. So I just look at her facial expression sometimes, I think. She must think I'm crazy. I look at her one time and I say, look, you know, you really hit the jackpot, haven't you? <laughs> And this is not right. I, I, honestly, I speak to my spiritual teacher. I have a few spiritual teachers. I said, what should I do? He said, whatever you have a thought like that, put it in a journal. And make it safar. Which is why I have these beads around my neck, you know? <laughs> honestly, I have the journal I've written down. And the journal's right now of ink and this and that. I have to get a new journal. <laughs> it gets so bad that I was speaking to my kids sometimes. And I don't... I say, don't call me dad. Just call me historical figure. <laughs> And they all call me Big Boss. I mean, that's 100%. If you go to them, I say, well, what would you call me? And I wouldn't give them what they want until they say the Big Boss. I say, so what's mommy? She's, she's a small boss. I say, that's right. But then the other day, something happened with my children, and they all ran to the mum. I was like, what happened? I thought I was the big boss. <laughs> I said, what's this? The point I'm making is there's a difference between ajab, which is a disease. I, yani, I, I have to be open and authentic with you. I suffer from this. I'm trying my best to, you know, I'm trying my best to get rid of it. <laughs> I don't know what to do to get rid of it, honestly. But I'm trying my best. Sometimes it just takes calamities to get rid of it. I remember when I was 14 years old. Yani, this was, yani, let me tell you this, I was, pre, I was pubescent at the age of 14. I was a late bloomer. I, this was before I became, like, I had puberty. And I was walking to school, and I, this was something that came from childhood. I remember exactly what I thought, and then I remember exactly what happened. I was walking to school, and I said to myself, my friend, you're indestructible. <laughs> I, I remember using this. I went to school and some bully touched me, threw me on the floor on the same day. And I was looking at my tattered clothes and I said, I thought you were indestructible. <laughs> delusions of grandeur. That's not confidence, honestly. That's what you call delusions of grandeur. But now, alhamdulillah, Allah has let me see my own mistakes. What I'm trying to say to you is not mentioning any other character in the world, not Andrew Tate or this person or that person, talking about just myself. I know full well there's a difference between a ta'ajjub, self-amazement, and a thiqa fin nafs, which is self-confidence. I don't want to, the, the reason why I'm bringing all these examples to your attention, because the last thing I ever want is to give you my bad traits. You know, I don't want this, but I do want 
And that's why I've not spoken about the issue of confidence before. Because I'm worried how I'm going to market it to you guys. What I do want and what I know for a fact is that the Muslim community will not survive without confidence. Ibn Abbas came to Umar ibn Khattab, a very confident figure, extremely confident. If someone saw him speak and his towering, he was probably about seven foot tall, huge figure, massive. Physically, sometimes you get physical with someone. Someone would get rude to him, he'd get physical, he'd hit them straight away. He, did, he had a stick he used to carry around with himself. Bang! And someone's like, oh, shut up, bang! This, honestly, this is Omar, like he was a big figure, you know. And he, Omar al Khattab, was asked, what does it take to make a great leader? A very interesting question. He said, لا يحمل هذا الأمر. You will not be able to be great leaders. إلا اللين في غير ضعف. Except for the lenient one, and other than weakness. And the strong one in other than aggression. And the generous one who's not extravagant. And the one who holds but is not stingy. You cannot be a leader except with these things. Now, some people have a false understanding of humility. They think humility means hum a humbleness. At-tawadu'a means always not doing something, refraining from something. I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm not this, I'm not that. When people do that, I look at them, I psychoanalyze them. I'm thinking, are you doing this because you are humble? Or are you doing this because you are scared? This is a real question. Are you scared? This is, um, let me just be on the yani. It's easy for weak and scared people to be humble. It's, yani, do you know, sorry to say, yani, if you are a coward and you pretend to be humble, you shouldn't be pretending to be humble because we already suspect your manhood. Yani, if you are a great man and then you are humble, okay, this guy here is re truly humble. Do you know what I mean? But if you're weak and scared, I do this, just do that. And now you're telling me, I don't, I don't, I don't do this. Then you, I don't know if you're a coward or if you're humble. I don't know whether to tell you you're humble or not. Because the, the hadith says, Man Allah, Whoever humbles himself to Allah, Allah raises him. It doesn't say, Man, man kana jabanan. <laughs> or man kana da'ifan. Whoever was a weak. In fact, the hadith says, Al mu'min al qawi, khayrun wa ahab ila Allah. Min al mu'min al da'ifu fi kulin khayr. That the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer, and both of them is good in them. And then the hadith continues, actually. And there's like a lot of advices in that particular hadith. But the point is this. The point is, it's time for the Muslim community to take ownership and to be confident. I can tell you one thing for sure. It's all about the energy you give off as a community. If the energy is a desperate, groveling, desperado energy, if you as men, or even as women, or whoever it is, or us as communities, we give off that energy, believe me, the other communities will sense it, they'll sniff it out just like a predator in the wild. They'll know it straight away. It's in the case with your, in your marriage. As well, when you get married, some of you are not married yet. If, uh, you'll see, and there's studies that back this up. A man who's always groveling to his wife, for example, you, yani, she knows straight away she's going to control him. 100% she's going to control him. Please don't leave, just come here, come back. Send that. Uh, why didn't you call? She's always calling, send that. And then she starts humiliating him. Send that, you, you shut your mouth and just you be quiet. Why don't you do the dishes and stuff like that? And, I went into the kitchen uh, the other day. <laughs> this is a true story, wallahi, and Allah is my witness, and my wife is probably watching this, yes? And my kids, I can't lie about this. I mean, I went into the kitchen, and I decided to take out a dish, you know, the dishes. And I started, like, scrubbing it a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everyone came in. My son, Ibrahim, came in. Then the other one came in. And then they called each other, and they, all three of them came in. And they looked at me, said, Dad, what the hell are you doing? I said, I'm just washing the dishes, son. And he thought it was a spectacle. 
I came out, my wife said, thank you so much. The kids were laughing and it was a joyful experience. My friend told me, he came out, he didn't take out the trash one day, his wife gave him a hard time. His wife humiliated him. He said, because you set a certain standard, brother, and I set another one. All due respect, I gave off one energy and you gave off another. My wife is fantastic. She does all kind of works in the house. But I wouldn't be able to give that standard unless I was a very generous man with her. Very affectionate man with her. Very spontaneous man with her. In more ways than one. I can't, we can't go into details. If I could do that and then I can... But then I was driving with my kids to the school. I said, yeah. Get into the car of the historical figure. Hurry up, close the door. <laughs> and as I was driving, my, my oldest daughter, Alia, her name is Alia, she started laughing just out of nowhere. I said, why are you laughing? She said, I just imagined you with an apron and in the kitchen washing. In her mind, gender roles are very clear. Okay, <laughs> in her mind, gender roles. What I'm saying is, as communities and as peoples, it's all about the energy that you give off. If the energy is a desperate, groveling, desperado energy, then you'll be treated like that, 100%, 1 million percent. There will be an apartheid upon an apartheid, intellectual apartheid, economic apartheid, this apartheid, that apartheid, humiliation. The only way people, listen, the only way people respect us is if they fear our consequences to some extent. Man amil al-aqubata asa al-adab. As the Arabs say, whoever doesn't fear the consequences will do what they want. Thomas Hobbes said, one of the great English philosophers, covenants are but words if they are not backed by swords. Covenants, covenants, aqud, are words if they are not backed by swords. Why was Abu Siddiq who he was? Because there was no price he was not willing to pay for Islam, for the community, for the mission. How comes those people in the beginning of Islam in the desert were able to take over the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire? How could they do that? Because they had the initiative. And Robert Greene, the, the famous writer of the book 48 Laws of Power, said the one who's willing to commit suicide has the initiative. Meaning the one who is willing to take it all the way. There's no price I'm willing to I'm gonna die for this thing. Khalas. That makes there's no better way of being alive as a human being than staring at the face of death and saying I'm willing to accept but for this mission because for us to be honest with you if we are going to survive as individuals and as a community we must go back to this mindset of ultimate bravery and tawakkul ala Allah tawakkul literally means complete reliance I'll put the money, I'll do this, I'll go there, I'll stop this, I'll do that, I'll help him, I'll do... This is the reliance mentality. In the rest, they are cowards now. Wallahi, also it's called diffusion of responsibility. It's a phenomenon in psychology. You see somebody being sexually assaulted, a woman, and everyone is just taking the phones out and watching it. And maybe they are pleasuring themselves with it. Whatever they are doing, they are not helping. They're, the Prophet says, من, من رأى منكم منكرًا فليغيره بيده. من قتل دون ماله فهو شهيد. If you see an evil, change it with your hand. If you died protecting your wealth, you're a shaheed, you're a martyr. It's that mentality. If, you, if we bring that mentality back, that mentality is worth more than a thousand arguments. It's that energy as a man, as a community, as a people that we can bring to the table, that if we have that energy and, that, and we bring that mentality, what well, there's nothing better than it. Which means we have to have our boundaries. When it comes to all issues, this is it. It's a mindset. When it comes to LGBT, the moment you start compromising a little bit, you give them an inch, they will want to take a mile. They want to just test you. What do lo tudhihinu fayudhihinu? They want to see if the prophets want to compromise, so you can compromise with him. Allah says that in the Quran. He says they want to see if he can compromise. He's telling him he's tutoring his prophet. He's saying they want to see if they can compromise with you, so they so, so you can compromise with them. In Surah Al-Qalam, 
verse 3. If we are going to survive as a community, we must have very clear hudud red lines. Don't mess about with this situation. This is our situation here. Don't mess about with us. In the marriage, as a man, you have to have the same red lines. I'm not saying go... Yani, I'm not saying what I'm doing is yani, the right thing. The men have Yani. <laughs> yani, you don't need to be like that. You can wash, you can clean, you can do this. And yani, There's a hadith about that. But what I was going to say was... <laughs> What I was going to say was, the point I'm saying is, create the boundaries and have confidence in your religion. And you will see. And that's worth dignity, it's human dignity as a community, as individuals. Do not ever sell that dignity for any paltry price. With that, I will open it up, inshallah, to questions and answers. And uh, this is the last day we have here at Cape Town. And we're going to go to Durban after that. Inshallah, then you guys are all welcome to see us in London anytime. Inshallah, and I feel like you guys are family now. I do feel like some familiar faces, and I do like Hamza. I'm sure feels the same way. We're gonna come back to South Africa because it's it's a beautiful place. Yeah, Inshallah, and by when we come back, there's even more institutions and more this and all that. And Inshallah, so let's open up for questions. And Hamza, come up as well with us so you can help me out. Inshallah, with that, uh, who's got any questions before we leave? Inshallah, yes, sir. Hey, up to you. I can hear. Yeah. Um, as an aspiring filmmaker, I'd like to ask you a question regarding the arts in Islam. As Muslim creatives, we are the storytellers that have to oppose the demonic narratives of the atheistic Western media, especially in relation to music and movies. That being said, the creative industry is full of so much fitna. And because monetizing your craft is so hard, many Muslim, Muslim creatives compromise on their religious values in order to earn money. Um, how do we protect our hearts while operating in a space that's filled with so much fitna? Look, I mean, the thing is, there's, with this, these questions, there are so many compound fiqhi masail. Like, for example, the issue of acting. A lot of scholars allowed it, a lot of scholars, maybe some scholars didn't allow it. I don't know where the scholars in this country accept the situation. Then you have within that who can act and how can act and this and that. So in a nutshell, what I'm going to say to you is that refer this to your local scholars, okay? Because at the end of the day, this is a fiqhi masala and it requires fatwa. It's a fiqhi masala which requires fatwa. But, you know, there are differences of opinion on each of the issues. And so depending on how one navigates those differences of opinion, then one can come to a conclusion on these issues. Yes? Uh, okay, is the mic with the ladies? After what I've said today, I'm, I think I'm going to be in trouble. I think South Africa, I've not really seen that strong feminism that I saw in the UK. It's not there, is it? It's not like what we have. Every time I go to university, there's some kind of, sometimes there's protests. I went to Ireland. I was going to go to Ireland. They, the LGBT said we're protesting. The whole school, Trinity College, it came on the news. They were all pro they said we're going to protest. If you come, this guy who was with Andrew Tate and this khala finish. We're going to protest and it's going to fill it up. And I said, you know what? They were scared, the security, and I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to create the fitna in Ireland. But many countries I go to, they, alhamdulillah, in South Africa, it's all right. It seems like an okay situation. At, at the end of the day, we are in Africa. We are not in uh, Europe. So hopefully it stays that way. Okay, so tell me now. What's the next question? With, with the ladies, I can't hear anything. I, but maybe, do I just hear it? Or is it going to, we're going to hear it now. Let me hear it. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, I wanted to ask in your talk when you mentioned um, about doing the dishes, do you, did you mean to discourage the male figure in the household from doing the dishes? By the way, I couldn't hear what she said. What did she say? Discouraging what? <laughs> Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, I'm just telling them my experiences. I'm no Qudwa. Or, so obviously the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu there's a hadith in Bukhari which says, Kana fi ahli, that he used to be in the service of his family. However, that hadith, 
doesn't say he used to cook for them and clean. And so to be honest, some people, they take the hadith and create something else out of it. Now, there are some discussion among the madhahib on the housework and whether, <laughs> see how I went up and I'll go down. <laughs> there are some discussion about, you know, in the madhahib about whether or not, what is wajib of the woman and what is, is it wajib or not wajib? But the Hanafi opinion says, <laughs> There is a discussion among the scholars about all of that. I mean, it depends on what culture, what, as I said, I wouldn't do this with my wife unless I compensated her massively. Like, you know, everyone's got their setup at home. I'm not trying to change. As I say, these are just my anecdotes. I'm just being honest. I think my wife doesn't mind. You know, she's fantastic around the house. She does really good work. I mean, most, and there's no woman that can handle my kind of, I, I think that some people, some women sometimes send me some DM, this and that. Do you, you want to get married to me and this and I'm thinking, are you, what do you think this is? Okay. What kind of marriage are you thinking about? Are you thinking about like, Annie, you're going to come to the house and do what my wife does? Oh, this is going to be a hard night for you. I mean, a hard day for you. <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to be horrible for you. What are you getting yourself into? That's why I've, I've always said, you know, don't, don't, don't send me these messages because it's, it's just a waste of my time and yours. I mean, uh, you're signing up for like uh, slavery, so to say. So that's not much. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. But yeah, no, I, I, in terms of that, and there is some discussion in Islam, it's about culture, it's about the agreements, it's about whatever. For me, I wouldn't accept. I'll be honest with you. Me, pers like me as a person, Oksum Bala would not accept. I would not accept anything like that. If a woman said, you know, you, you do half, I do half. I say, what do you mean? Yani? I don't know how to cook. And it's one of those things I want to continue being the case. Yani, no, I'm being serious. I actually get a headache when someone starts cooking in front of me. I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I'm not, this is my personal preference. Yani, everyone's allowed their own thing. Yani. So me, I actually get angry by it. <laughs> when I see a man do the dishes, I personally just don't like I don't like it. I mean, I'm, everyone's got their thing. I don't like it. But, but I'm just saying, <laughs> it doesn't mean just because I don't like it, another man doesn't like it, or you shouldn't do it. No problem, so. But then again, if you look at the seal of the Prophet, sorry to say, I don't see many of the narrations of him cooking and cleaning. I don't see it. Kanafi mihnati ahli is the maximum you're going to get. And if you look at the hadith closely, it's doing his own things, yani. His own chew, his own this, his own. He's not really cooking. I haven't seen a narration that says he used to cook for his family. I haven't seen it. No, I'm being serious, yani. We have so many narrations of intimate details. How come we don't have a narration of him cooking for his family? We don't have it. How come we don't have a narration of him cleaning and squeezing the, the house? We don't have those. Actually, we don't have those narrations. I'm sorry to say, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Maybe you do have it somewhere. But is he going to go to each nine wives and clean their houses? Safa Allah, you, 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 you're making the Prophet something, uh, something uh, where well, he's not. But then again, Ghazali mentions, when I was reading his book of Takabbur, he says, the man who, who thinks that doing the housework is above him, this is a form of arrogance. And I read that. I said, I, I, I completely changed my attitude for one day. And I was reading Yahya al -Mudin. Honestly, you asked my wife, for one day there was a respite. There was like ceasefire. <laughs> it was like ceasefire. So in, in, in a nutshell, there's all kinds of opinions in Islam. I don't see that the prophetic character was one who was yani, doing these kinds of things in the house. I don't see that. Having said that, there is difference of opinion among the fuqaha, among whether yani, it's wajib for the woman, it's not wajib, it's mustahab, it's part of the arf or whatever. I take the opinion it's wajib. And if a woman doesn't agree with it, she can leave. I'll divorce her. Yani, because I have the initiative. Now, I think it was what I would say. Like, for example, I would say, look, yani, into talik, yani. Yani, uh, for, for example, I would say, my opinion is that you have to do the housework. If you don't like it, then into talik. I'll get a woman who does like it. I mean, but, yani, is this not, is it not in my hat to divorce a woman? Yani, all my have say it's, it's, it's jayis to divorce. It's not a uh, haram. You know, obviously, some say that it's, it's yani, what do you call it, makruh. Some say it's makruh. And some say it's, I'm not encouraging divorce, but I'm saying me personally, I don't want to, you see? So I'm not encouraging or discouraging. I'm just telling my personal preference. Uh, so anyway, we'll go to the next question. I, I, yes, sir. I, I, I'll just quickly come into back here. My father's Iraqi and I was fortunate to spend two and a half weeks there and they were with you that I didn't observe once men ever doing any yes. domestic work. The women are totally... Yes. Of that. So, so the Iraqis are with you. 
But um, I just want to thank you. And for the... the ones. That's why they, mashallah, they've always been known to create great civilizations, you know. We are the cradle of civilization. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead. Anyway, with the nationalism no, aside, go ahead. <laughs> I, for the hadith that if you yeah. don't thank people, you don't thank Allah, I just first want sure. to take the opportunity to thank you. Thank you so much. For, I think Hamza mentioned yesterday about awareness, for raising the awareness of liberalism. And as you said it last night, that it's a religion. It's something I wasn't aware of. And I think in the history of Islam, our enemies have always been overt, whether they were the Mongols or the Crusaders or the Romans or the Assassins. But I think liberalism is a covert enemy. That's not one you can see. And if you've not been alerted to that's liberalism and the fact that it's a religion and the poison of liberalism and all the isms which Hamza mentioned, you won't be able to actually understand it and combat it and keep your faith. So on my question, you know, leading on to that is I have a family member of mine that actually moved to the UK and unfortunately is now fallen into the liberalism trap so how do you you sort of bring somebody that's now gone over into liberalism back to orthodox islam i think that you know you've got to think of religion uh, liberalism as you said as a religion Akhi. like you've got to think of it as you a, said oh, that yeah i mean it's you know but you know but do you know what i mean and you've got to bring them back to the basics of islam if you truly believe allah is the true god he's worthy of worship and you truly believe muhammad sallam was a final messenger then all of our morality all right and wrong goes back to this Really and truly. We don't need anything outside of that to tell us what's right and wrong. The problem, you won't get shubuhat if your judur and your usul and your foundations okay, are tight. You will not get shubuhat. That's why Allah, he, he does tashbih in the Quran with kalimatan tayyibah, kashajaratin tayyibah. He says that the, the similitude of the la ilaha illallah, kalimat tayyibah is like a tree which is firm. Yani asluha thabit wa far'uha fa sama. And the Quran says that. Its, 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 its roots are deep rooted and its branches are in the sky. Meaning, if the reason why people have issues with some of the ahkam of Islam is because they have inqiyad issues, they have submission issues. Yani, all of these things, we can deal with them as like branches of the tree, shubha, shubha, shubha. The truth of the matter is they have an issue with the proposition of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So in reality, they need to go back to convincing themselves that there's only one God worthy of worship, and Muhammad Rasulullah is the final prophet. If someone is 100% sure of this, like Abu Bakr Siddiq, they wouldn't even have a shubha. It's, in, yani, it's muhal akhlan, actually, it's impossible. They would never have shubha. Like, can you imagine of Abu Bakr Siddiq with his temperament and his spirituality having shubhas? I cannot imagine of the situation. The reason why is because he knew of a certain of certainty that La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. He knew it. In qalha fa sadaq. If he said it, then he spoke the truth. Simple as that. Simple. We don't need philosophy for this. Actually, philosophy is, is, is irrelevant. In qalha fa sadaq. So if he said it, I'm sure he was speaking the truth. He was a true prophet. He was actually he, the, the angel came to him on the seventh century and did inspire him. And it wasn't him making it up. And he wasn't mental or majnoon, and he wasn't uh, fabricating it. No, no, it was an angel, because the stuff in it would indicate has to be from God, which we have arguments for and we've spoken other times. Which means everything that comes from this, whatever the Prophet gave you, gives you, then take it. Whatever he tells you to leave off, then leave off. Go, so I'll, to obey Allah and obey the messenger and those of authority among you, like the scholars, yani. And if you differ on something, go back to Allah and his messenger. They don't truly believe, oh, by your Lord. Look, Allah is being emphatic. By your Lord, they don't truly believe until they make you hakam, judge. Oh, Muhammad, you have to be the judge of what their tenazu'at, their disputes, their discord amongst themselves. And they don't find in their heart any problems. Yani no issues come about, is this right, is this wrong, any questions? No. Where you sallimu taslima and they're fully submissive. Like, for example, let me give you a situation. If you, yani, yeah, God forbid, if someone in our family has cancer, and then we have the most specialist cancer doctor who's there in the hospital. He says, this needs to happen now. This surgical repair has to happen now. Otherwise, this person is going to die. I am the senior here. I am the top doctor in cancer research on this leukemia or this, whatever, breast uh, surgery, whatever it is. I'm the best. I've seen the thing. 
I've seen the MRIs. I've seen the, the blood tests. He has to do surgery, 100%. None of us would have any haraj. Go take him to the, uh, if you love that person, take him to the operating room. Hurry up. Whatever money it takes. Why? Because you're certain there's no better choice for you because his, his authority is better than your own. You're certain. And, and Yanni, it could be conceived he's wrong, by the way. A second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion. Could be conceived. But we would still entrust that doctor aside from ourselves, for example. But when it comes to Allah's laws and prescriptions, which are more informed than any doctor's diagnosis, we have haraj and we have tashabuha and we have uh, shubha in our hearts. That means that really the question is not about the, the, the hukum itself, it's about the authority. You are not giving your authority to Allah and His Messenger fully. That's in qiyad issues. That's issues with submission. That means the proposition of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you have not fully uh, taken that on board. If you've taken that on board 100%, you would not have any issues. 100%. Million percent. Man, woman, or child. I'm going to say child, uh, not really with children because, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the children are the child is not uh, accountable but you will not have an issue do you see what I'm do you see what I'm saying brother so that's how to answer the question do you want to take the next one okay should we do one more uh, from the sisters yeah. uh, just just uh, I'll come to you sister in a second but just a uh, senior man here wants to ask a question I'll, I'll come to you in a second sister go ahead sir. Quran they found in the, in the yes in Birmingham University they found a a manuscript which dates back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, of three particular surahs Surah Al-Kahf Surah, uh, Surah Maryam and Surah, I think a part of Surah Taha and it turns out according to them it's a hundred percent match with what we have today so they are corroborating exactly what we have but I will say to you even if they didn't I wouldn't care uh, yani, with all due respect yani, what, are we waiting for the white man to stamp our religion because then he can control everything then. Yani, if we had to rely on the testimony of the white man for the, for the preservation of the Qur'an, then the whole religion is uh, mahdoom, finished. So uh, they're doing that, maybe, wallahu alam, they're doing it because they want to give you good news, good news, good news, and then bad news. So you can build their confidence. I don't care what they say. We have, if you want preservation of Qur'an, we have tabaqat al-qurra written by Ibn al-Jazari, which tells you all the asanid, going back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of them, yani. Going back to, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, Asim, going back to Hafs, Asim, Sha'al, whatever, then uh, Abu Abd al Sulami, and then Ibn Mas'ud, and then uh, Uthman al Affan, and then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have. We have. With the Qiraat, all of the Qiraat, and all of this, we all have it written down, yani. And we have uh, our own ways of uh, affirming that something is Quran, which is that it has to be in line with the Sanad. Of narration has to be in line with the Arabic language, the classical fasha of the time, and it has to also be in line with uh, it has to be in line with the Rasm al-Uthmani, which is the the khat, the actual written what Uthman wrote down Ibn Affan, whose daughters were married to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who had the lejna. All the Sahabas came together and said, "Yes, this is what we heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." So we have that. We don't need anybody else, whether Birmingham or the Oxford or the Harvard or whatever. You're saying is good. Okay, whatever. Thank you very much. Yeah, I whatever. It's good for you. Yeah, and if I speak to a white man, I say, look, the white man, you, even the white man agrees. But, if, but, but for me, I don't need you. Sorry to say, uh, I don't need you at all. Yeah. And this is how the community should be. We don't wait, wait for any rubber stamp from... Uh, look, at, we had to wait 30 years ago for the apartheid government to just say that the black man and the white man can walk in the street together in the same place. If we had to wait for the white man to tell us what to do, then we'd have to wait thousands of years for everything. I was having a debate with the atheists and we said to them, they were telling us, why don't you agree with our morality or our morality and our morality? I said, our morality, you mean your morality? I said, why do you think you should impose your morality on me, Yanni? I said, you have your morality, I have mine. Why are you imposing it on me like this? I said, uh, and then he started to try to attack the Quran and Sunnah. You'll see the video. It's very, very entertaining, by the way. You'll see it tomorrow. Me and Hamza was, Yanni. It became, it became like a spectacle, by the way. Uh, but Yanni, we said, you, only 30 years ago, you decided racism was wrong. The Prophet left he says there's no a virtue of a black man or a white man a thousand years, three hundred years, three or four hundred years ago. And you only found that out thirty years ago. So what do we well, have to keep waiting? We have to keep waiting for you to get it wrong and right. Today you're telling us that a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, you know. You X, Y, and X, X, and this and that, Yani. You keep changing your morality and you keep changing this and you keep we're not we don't care about you. 
We told you, we only care about for you to come to Islam. Yes, we invite. But for the morality and the hegemony and this and that, we sorry, no. We have the haq. We have the truth. And we believe it's the truth from Allah. It's not about race or religion. We are saying we're all equal in terms of race. That's what we, we've been saying that for years, actually. That's why you, this, Islam is the only religion which has had this much impact on this many cross diversity of uh, civilizations, black civilizations, Arab civilizations, Turkish civilizations, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in, in Europe, Ottoman Empire, all, all the way to Bulgaria and Greece, where this man's from. <laughs> so, where the Ottomans took the people over and stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what I'm saying is, you see, yeah, we're not waiting for anybody to approve. We're not waiting because this is the trap. You, when, you, when you give them approval abilities, we approve. One person said uh, in the debate, I wanted to interject, but I didn't want to be too rude. He said, I'm very impressed with your argument. I was like, what the hell do you mean I'm impressed with your argument? Yani, I'm waiting for you to be impressed or not impressed. Yani, you're the judge and I'm the defendant. Yani, you're Gordon Ramsay. Have you heard of Gordon Ramsay? The chef. Yani, مثلاً, the Muslim people, yeah, we, 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 Islam is a, a dish. We've cooked it for you. Nice one, yeah? And like a biryani or whatever. Mashallah, I love Indian food. And you put the dish like that, and then the, and then the white liberal, yes, he's eating the dish, hmm, and he's deciding whether he likes it or not. And like Gordon Ramsay, he can spit it out. And if he spits it, sorry. <laughs> That's a blessed one, you know? You have the you have that from this the historical figure doing that. See how that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not waiting for them to uh, affirm and give us the approval rating that this is yes, this is the one. The smile of Gordon Ramsay. The smile of the white man. Oh, they will not. Well, then, well, this is the most. And I cannot imagine. And what, it's a prediction, by the way. But it's an, this is no problem. It's talking about well, then, It doesn't say well, then, By the way, this is very interesting. It's not lam and it's not la. Lam means in the future. Lam, noon, means in the future. Mustaqbal. It means this is a prediction of the Quran. The Quran is saying the Jews and the Christians will never be happy with you until you follow their way. Yeah, and you have to, do, you have, sorry to say, you have to do the, the Christ thing and Trinity or this or that. You have to be the, exactly what they want. The liberals are the same. We know that 100% until you follow exactly what they want and you say LGBT and you have the, yeah, and maybe a small rainbow thing here. They will say, okay, come, no problem. It's like the passport, the stamp of rule. We're not waiting for that. We have to produce our own systems. Because if we wait for that house, we have become enslaved. We have become intellectually molested. <laughs> we have become enslaved. So this, my point is, I don't even know why I said this, but we're not waiting for them to eat our food and, and agree with it. Uh, this is, goes back to the point about the palimpsest. Yes, though it does, it does confirm there's a surahs that we have in the Quran today. The sister wanted to ask a question. <laughs> Yes, um, the question was, do you have any advice for beginner da'wah givers? Yes, uh, do you have any advice for beginner da'wah people? Look, you can't learn how to swim if you don't get in the water. Someone asked me, what's your advice for marriage? I said, do it. <laughs> and then they asked me when I was married, I said, don't do it. <laughs> And then they asked me two years later, I said, do it again. <laughs> but the point is, is that dawah, like anything that requires practical abilities, dawah requires mumarasa. It requires practical application. You will learn more from interacting with people, from speaking, seeing the emotional reactions, responding. Like, I don't used to make this many jokes. It's only when I came to Cape Town, I saw these guys are quite lively. Let me try a couple of things today. Because I've been trying these jokes for the last 10 years and my marriage has not been working. <laughs> the only person that's been laughing at my jokes is me. You see what I mean? So now you guys have affirmed, you know, but what I'm saying is when you go and speak to people and you, and you test them out, you find out that, okay, this, this works, this doesn't, it's trial and error. 
It's like marriage. But I'm not going to go into further details because that would require a long session. But you would agree, like Annie, most things in life, you have to try it out. It's a practical thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like a chef. Even though I have no experience in the matter, there's a difference between... <laughs> I, by, by the way, this is uh, unusual, yeah? I hate doing the cooking, but I love watching people doing it. And I don't mean that with the woman and this. I'm, I'm talking about, like, I actually watch Gordon Ramsay doing it. I love to watch it. I don't know about you guys. I love when someone produces a good meal. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I'm very impressed, honestly. But there's a difference between a chef and a scientist, although they're both playing around with the ingredients. A diet is more like a chef. Because a chef, he's playing different flavors. He's trying it out. He's giving it to different people. He's seeing how they react. He's, he's got a restaurant. He's seeing this works. This is, you know what I mean? The one. A scientist is trying to put things together to see if they're making reactions and stuff like that. He'd, because the thing is with a scientist, he's only concerned with the chemical reactions. The chef is concerned with the human reactions. And we are not robots. So you have to be more like a chef, not like a scientist. And to be more like a chef, you have to get into the kitchen. Well, of course, that's something I'm not going to do. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, fadlaf. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Hamza was speaking earlier, and yesterday you also spoke about the many isms. Yes. And I'm of the firm belief, so I'm at university, and there are many young Muslims like me who have identified just how problematic specifically the issue of feminism is within our current generation, really? especially among the Muslim populace. Mm -hmm. And what I see as something very dangerous is that I see this within our communities over here, is that there are certain institutions which are responsible for the dissemination really? and the acquisition of sacred knowledge. So Ilm, I'm not going to mention names specifically. Shame them. And <laughs> Name and shame them, brother. And, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. and there I'm are like certain it. individuals who our communities look up to as scholars who yes. are perpetuating certain narratives that really? are full of feminism, hmm. but either there is a lack of awareness from people, they're not really called out by other people, and how do we as the youth, when we identify these things, coming from a position of not having the same authority in terms of Islam because of our lack of knowledge and time in the sphere, how do we go about combating this or being awareness about this? You do it, you don't need to have that much knowledge. I, I went to the UAE just the other day. Actually, we went together. And I was in the I was in a taxi and there was a Yemeni man inside. And he was telling me he has three wives. And he's a very, and he, he, he's a man is faqir, and wallahi, I think he said he had two. Two or three, I cannot remember exactly. But two at one time, three another and stuff. And he started giving me, and my cousin was there in the, in the taxi, a lesson. I just stayed quiet. The man didn't have that much knowledge. But he just had those, he just had boundaries. You can tell he was an older man, like he, he, maybe he's 80 years old. He's like an old man, like 82, 83. And he was driving us around. He said, yes, I just told her this, and I just I told her that, and, and whatever. Like, you, know, you can see the man was not, and he has that tawakkul in Allah. That if you have taqwa of Allah, don't worry about it. Meaning, if we have a generation of, yeah, for example, feminism, where does it affect us mostly? In marriages, in families. If we have a generation of people who had such harsh boundaries against it, that they will become specialist detectors. I have a feminist detector now. Anything which sounds remotely feminist, I pick it up so quickly. It's like... Okay. I even spoke to a guy the other day and he, in the gym, wallahi, and he said something, and I, and I looked at him a different way because he said something was so feministic, it was so deeply feministic, and he doesn't realize it. He goes, nowadays people are just getting two and three wives. I was like, what the hell do you mean, Yanni? What would you say about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So, Yanni, the point is, is that this Yemeni guy, in the, this is an archetype of an individual who just doesn't tell us that this is a my haq. This is my thing. This is as simple as that. And what is your consequence? The question all goes back to, what is your consequences? As human beings today, we have to produce, as communities, we have to produce consequences. If you, produce, if you don't produce consequences, you will be a part of someone else's. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, and tell it, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, and tell it, uh, uh, and tell it, al-amatu rabbataha. That the mother will give birth to her slave master, which means what? 
The child has more consequence than the parent. Now what we're seeing, go to the West and see, wallahi, the parents, how they're treated, ask him. They're treated like disgusting. I had a neighbor of mine, there was a smell coming out of the house. The police came, they opened the door, they saw the man was dead. The woman was dead, it was a woman. And I said, why is she dead? She said, because it was in the house for so long and the, the children didn't come to check on her. They don't care. They're known for, like, yani, they, they're selfish people. They don't care about their families. Because the parents didn't put in place consequences for the child. So the child became uh, mut as the, uh, which means rebellious. As the famous poet said, al mutanabbi He says, إِذْ أَنْتَ أَكْرَمْتَ الْكَرِيمَ مَلَكْتَهُ وَإِذْ أَنْتَ أَكْرَمْتَ الْلَئِيمَ تَمَرَّدَ If you are generous with the generous, you've got him. He's, he's loyal to you for life. But if you're generous with the sly one, he'll be more sly with you. He'll be more sly with you. It's not generosity when you're doing it with certain people. So with the feminist, she will never, ever thank you for being what you are and doing, bending to her will. There's good, there's actually good research to show. The more you do that, the more she will actually be, she will be repelled by you. There's biological research that shows that yani, she'll be repelled by you if, she, if, you, if you do that. If you don't have any boundaries and you don't, she, she doesn't find you exciting anymore. And there's even biological research to show, that, and I'm not going to mention his long stories, but that she'll be put off from you from a physical perspective as well. She doesn't consider you as a man. Yeah, you're always doing what she says. So the point is, with these uh, particular ones, I would say if you have a strong boundary, you say no. Learn to say no. Learn to say, just say no. I spoke to, I'm not going to mention you, a very famous female. Yes, very famous female. Very famous. You probably all know her. And I was having a communication. And she's extremely disagreeable. And, and I said, well, why don't you do this? You know what she said? I don't want to. She's learned to say no in a very strong way. Ahi, we can learn to say, I don't want to. What's, the, yani, what's going to happen if you say, I don't want to? What's your reason for saying, I don't want to? No, no, no. Why do I have to justify myself? Yani. No, no, because yani, when they say, what's your reason? It means now you have to answer questions. You have to justify yourself as a man. Why, why don't you want to do the dishes? Sorry, that's the wrong question. I refuse to answer. My consequences is you're not going to be with me. Simple as that. Yani, I don't, I'm not here to debate. I, this, these, there's a difference between negotiation and debate. I debate with professional, academic, debaters, or street thugs. No problem. I'll debate with anyone. But I, when it's time for debate, I'll debate them. But when it comes to negotiation, no, I don't, I'm not going to debate you. I haven't been paid for this. I'm, I don't get paid for any debate, by the way. Um, yani, any of my engagements, all of this is free, alhamdulillah. Yani, me and, I've never, even any lecture, by the way, I don't get paid for anything, alhamdulillah. Yeah? And this is not to praise myself. I'm just, some shaitan might come and say, look, this guy's probably got big money, you know? So, yeah, I don't get paid for the lectures. What I'm saying is, there's a difference between negotiation and debating. Negotiation, yes and no, and consequences. That's all you need. Yani, if you had yes and no, and then a box of consequences, you're the master negotiator. Debate, you have reasons and justifications and questions and answers and rhetorical questions and all this. When I'm negotiating now, all I have to my disposal is two words. Yes, no, and consequences. Uh, are you going to do the housework? Are you going to? Uh, would you allow your wife to work? Uh, you can decide. So, yeah, and method, and, sorry to say, yeah, the context might be different. Yeah, African, I don't know. She might have to go out and do something, or the household. Yeah, and, I'm not saying a woman cannot work, for example. So you might say yes. You might say yes, but you have to be sure that you can live with that for the next 50 years. Don't ever say yes to something that you can't live with for the next 50 years. The, the dean and a relationship is a marathon. It is not a sprint. If you try and say, if you say yes now to something that you're going to say no to later on, then you're you, you, you're doing something bad for yourself. You're going to create a problem later on. You're going to create resentment. That's what's going to happen. You're going to resent the person. You're going to resent the woman. You're going to hate her, and she's going to hate you. And that actually does apply to the woman as well. She's making negotiation. What what can I not live without? And that needs to be robust. But then obviously it cannot override Hukul Islam. It cannot override that. So what I'm saying is the thing that's going to beat feminism is no argument. It's all attitudes and negotiations. If you have a generation of people that say no, feminism will be done because women need a companionship. So if, they, if all the men say no, I don't accept this in my household. 
you'll be divorced. Yani literally, if you come and you, yani if I sense from you in the first year that you are imposing this, my ultimate thing, your strongest power as a man, for example, is your power to walk away from a relationship. That's why Allah gave you that right. He gave you that right for a reason. So what are you going to say? Go all the way. Khalas. You live without me. She might go to her next man, her next man, and if we have all these men that don't accept the man, she's going to be khalas. She's going to realize she cannot survive. So as a man, the feminist, Muslim, so-called feminist, which is a contradiction in terms anyway, but that woman, she's going to go from man to man and realize that she has no home. And then khalas, she'll be extinct within three generations. Like a dinosaur. <laughs> That's what will happen. And that's how we have to deal with the situation. Through practical means, through negotiation. This has become a matter of negotiation. It's no longer become a matter of argumentation. But men have to be ready to bite the bullet on this one. You can't be so thirsty and desperate for a woman's love and attention. And wallahi, they, they, they sense it and they see it. You're so desperate for them. You think you're the only one. She sees that. She sees that you're groveling over her. She sees that you think you're the only, she can, she's the only one that can fulfill you. She's, and then she don't like you no more, mate. Even if a woman does that to a man, by the way, partner pursuit. If a woman does that to a man so much, she, the man can get sick of it. It's like eating so much honey and honey. It's true, we love affection, but when it's too clingy, like, you know what I mean? That's why the Prophet Muhammad said, Sharaf al Ummah is Qiyamuhum Bilayl. That the dignity of the mu'min, of the, of the uh, Ummah, is standing up at night. And their dignity comes from their dependence, independence from the people. You're not always groveling and needing the people. At Dimishqi, one of the great scholars of Islam, he said that Allah is the Ghani. Al-Ghani, which means the self-sufficient. And the more you come closer to being al the more the Ghani, the more closer that you become to fulfilling one of the attributes of Allah. The more perfect, perfect you become as a human being. Which means that you need to be an individual, that if you are trapped in a dark room by yourself with minimal food, minimal this, minimal that, you could be sane, you could survive because you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's true independence. You don't depend on money, this, that, you need to, this is zuhd. This is the true meaning of zuhd. When the companion came to the Prophet and said, أَدُلِّرْنِي عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِذَا فَعَلْتُهُ أَحَبَّنِي اللَّهِ he said, as is had for dunya, you have book Allah. Leave off the dunya and Allah will love you. Was had fima in the nest, you have kanas. And leave off what the people have and the people will love you. Because they're no longer jealous of you. Oh, he's got more money than me, this and that. They have ghira and jealousy and resentment of the situation. So just be independent. Be ready to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any, any of these things in the dunya that would distract you. That's why we have fasting. That's why we have salah. That's why we have these things in Islam just to connect us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an amazing religion. Which is why you find that people are coming into this religion. It's become trending now because people have had enough. The modern world has made people sick. They're all dependent on drugs and screens. But people are dependent on screens, addicted. <laughs> Vaping, screaming. Vaping, screaming, eating. A woman cry, cry, I need you, I need you. Man, and then this and that, and Muzmach, whatever you guys use in South Africa, I don't know, you, we have something called Muzmach. Right? It's good to find a partner, I'm not saying anything. But just the idea of addiction, 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 addiction. And the moment you leave it for one day, khalas, you become, you have a freeze, you have a panic attack. Anyway, next, let's do a couple of more questions, inshallah, because I know it's, it's getting late for everyone. Uh, let's take one from the sister, so let's try and be inclusive here. <laughs> no, I mean it. Go ahead, sister. Should all, uh, with LGBTQ+, plus getting introduced into primary schools and high schools, do you have any advice for parents? Yes, LGBTQ uh, curricula being introduced in high schools. And now this is the biggest fitna in England now. People are leaving England for this now. People are leaving the United Kingdom and Canada. And they're making hijrah for this issue because they can't afford private schools for their kids. And they are being forced, okay, their kids being forced to see something and even see things. Sex education, this and that and all that. It's too much. 
And it's not just, okay, if it was just a matter of seeing shahwa things, wallahi, that's less problematic than the ideology that comes with it. Yani if, if I knew that, okay, my child will go to school and he'll see some pornographic images, and that's it. Now, I'd be very upset and disgusted by that, but I'm even more disgusted that someone is trying to convince him that this is correct. So what I'm saying is, it's a serious topic, you know. And you guys, first and foremost, you have to be, you have to be grateful to Allah that in South Africa, the situation has not reached this. In England, if you go against it, if you say, I don't believe in homosexuality is okay, moral, they will report your child as a non-violent extremist. They will report the child. I'm not sure, it's not got to reach that level, has it? Yeah, they will report your child as a non-violent extremist. The parent will be reported. They will be under surveillance. So they have to remain silent and quiet. The whole community is remaining silent and quiet. In South Africa, you don't have that level of situation. Which means what? Which means you have to work within whatever guidelines you have. And if you have the ability to state your situation, then say it and do it. If you have the ability to remove your child from that situation, then do it. If you have the ability to put them into Islamic school, then do it. If you have the ability to homeschool them, then do it. Because that's become, now it's you're competing as a parent with another parent. That's effectively what it is. And especially in the West, if you're second generation and your language is different to the child's language, they might win because they may be more inclusive. They may have this. They may have better arguments. They may be more charismatic. Why are you playing the game in the first place? The child is like a sponge or it's more like a wet, wet clay, wet clay. When the child is young, it's like wet clay. You move him around and then as he gets older into like, 10, 11, 12, 13, he starts to dry up. Which means that the ideas of that child become entrenched and they become like that. For, it's less likely to change afterwards. So putting a wet piece of clay into a cauldron or into with a sculptor who's going to sculpt them in a different manner is a very bad idea. You cannot do this. If you have a, ch a choice and a chance to stop it, then stop it. And then if you have a chance to combat it, the masajid and the madaris have to do LGBTQ education. Not, of course, doing their narrative, but we have to do our narrative. And using the arguments. And each person, and we have to have different things. Like, for example, we have to have arguments against the morality, but we also have to have pastoral care. Like, for example, someone is different if someone has the feelings of being gay and they're Muslim. How do you deal with that guy? That, that guy needs some specialist help, actually. They shouldn't be shunned in the community if they think it's haram. This guy has done nothing wrong. If it's a man or a woman, he's done nothing wrong. He just has some feelings. But we'll take this guy and we speak to the guy. We give him a counselor. He's maybe an anonymous service. Anonymous service. He says, oh, what shall I do? They used to have something called conversion therapy. They've banned it in, in the UK. I don't think they've banned it here. You should have these programs. And then they show, this is what you do, the first thing, second thing. I had a situation, Hamza said me say this like three times now, a man with a big beard <laughs> came to me and he said, I'm having homosexual feelings. <laughs> Have you guys heard this from some of you? Yeah? Well, let me say, it. he said, I'm having homosexual feelings. And he was, I said, okay, what's going on? I was in the speaker's corner. He looked back and he said, I'm, come here, let me speak to you in, in a private. I said, fine. I said, uh, I'm no psychologist, but let me just have a conversation with you. I said to him, uh, do you want to be with a man for the rest of your life? Do you want to be romantically involved with a man for the rest of your life? He said, no, I don't. He said, I just feel sexually attracted to other men. I said, fine. I said, I said, what about a woman who is a bit more like a man? Like a bodybuilder woman? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, he said, like an androgynous woman, big and bodybuilder. He said, yeah, he put his head to the sky and he thought about it. He said, you know what? He said, yeah, I would like that more than a normal woman. I said, aha, so it's a matter of extents. So you can, you can change yourself a little bit. He said, I don't know what you mean. I said, I'll tell you what I mean. I said, do you drink coffee? He said, yes, I drink coffee. I said, how often do you drink? He said, every day I have coffee. You guys have fantastic coffee here, by the way. Compared to the UK, the UK I can never go back there. I cannot drink that stuff no more. I cannot drink it. <laughs> it's amazing how you do it, mashallah. But anyway, I said, do you drink coffee? He said, yeah, I have it every day. I said, uh, do you remember the first time you've ever had coffee? He said, yes. I said, what was your experience? He said, it was very bitter. I didn't like it. I hated it. I said, and then what happened? He said, I drank it a second time. 
I liked it a little bit more. And then I said, well, then what happened? He said, drank it again. I said, it's the same thing with women, you know. <laughs> I said, you might not like them at first. But, but the point I was making to him is that you can change your sexuality. Yeah, and if it's possible, the homosexual will tell you, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but they have like what you would call conversion. You know how we have a revert and he comes and he says, I found Islam by looking at the Quran and I saw this verse and then it made so much sense to me and I became Muslim. Yes, you have conversion stories. The homosexuals have conversion stories as well. If you see it online, how did you become, how I became gay? They say, like, how I came out of the closet. I don't know what closet they're talking about, by the way. This is a magical closet that everyone's coming out of, right? But they, the guy said, if, for example, I, I discovered I, I became gay when I realized this and I realized that. And I thought, oh my God. I said, interesting. I said, so you think you can change from being homosexual to be, for a heterosexual to being homosexual? So then you must believe it's okay to become straight. If, it's, if you can become gay, then you can become straight. If, if it's fluid one way, then it must be fluid the other way as well. Which means for us, as, and this is true, you can change your tastes. When I was younger, I used to like sweetie things. Like, you know, we all used to like it. Now I like potato, steaks, and this and that. When I come to South Africa, uh, I love the food here. We have something called Nando's. You have it here as well. It's become so popular in England. I'm not sure if you know this. And then I saw a new one called Pedro's. It's become like the competition. Hopefully they don't tell me Pedro was gay or something. Like that. <laughs> the LGBT version of Nando's. <laughs> even even some like non-related companies have got like gay adverts. I don't know why. Yeah. Have you noticed that? It's like, become like a mad ideology. It's like they're shoving it in ever in everyone's face. It's a crazy thing. But anyway, the, the point is that w there must be pastoral care. Yani, we must have something for, and here, I cannot say this in England. Why? Because England, this conversion therapy is illegal. They can close your charity. If you had a masjid, and I said this in England, they would close it down. Do you know that? If you, if you said this in a school, they will take your kid out of school. They will take the parent. Well, it's not as free as they say it is. Here I can say it, so I am going to say it. And this is what I wish I could say back in England and USA. I go to England, I go to USA, I go to Canada, I cannot say what I'm saying now. You have the ultimate advantage of all English-speaking Muslim minorities. You must be able to take this opportunity and seize it. They, they would wish in England and America to be able to do pastoral care and conversion therapies and stuff like that. They would wish to do that. Everyone's ready, they have so many counselors that are ready to do it. I don't know why it's not happening across the Masajid and across the place in Madaris here in South Africa. It has to happen. We have to have an anonymous service which deals with people who have homosexual inclinations. We have to treat them. You, did you know that homosexuality was designated as a disease in the DSM register, which is the, the official register of psychology? It was seen as a disease. It was mentioned in the DSM register in the 60s. And then they changed it after they've legalized homosexuality in England and in America. How could a disease change because of civil rights? How? How could a psychological disease change form? How could the psychological community change their opinion due to current political and economic and social trends? That must mean that diseases are now being formed by the white man. He has so much power to tell us what is right and wrong that he's not even telling us what's right and wrong. He's telling us what's a disease and what isn't. Now it's a disease to be homophobic. So now it was okay. Yani, being homosexual was a disease. Now saying you're wrong to the guy is disease. You went from one extreme to another. So what I'm saying is, we must act on this issue. And you have a very special opportunity. Inshallah, I'll take that one. Should we have two more questions or one more question? Two more questions? Oh, two more questions, fine. For the people of South Africa. First from the sisters. First from the sisters. You had a question already. Did you not? Oh, did you not? It was someone else who looked just like you. SubhanAllah. <laughs> I think, I don't know. Sister, please go ahead. So, question is um, Do you have any advice regarding Islamic rulings um, with electronic devices and social media in the household? Oh, yeah. Oh, he's talking about social media and whether or like, do I have any advice on it? Islamic, like, um, Islamic advice. Sorry. Give me some specific question. Like, what do you, what do you mean exactly? Like, watching social media? Um, or oh, TikTok I'm, and stuff. 
time management and content management. Yeah, exactly. exactly. How do you do this? Very difficult. Like TikTok should be off limits for everybody. Yeah, and one one guy told me one time go to uh, go on TikTok. It's very important. I'm on TikTok, by the way. And you may, but it's not me. It's not me managing the account. You know. And before there was a guy that was on it. And, and let me tell you something. TikTok. I went on it. I said, okay, fine. Let's see what this is the fuss is about. I went on it. I saw women jumping about. And I said, this is pornography. I said, how can you expect me to go on that? Yeah. And then Oksum Bala said, whatever it is, this is triggering me. I have to be honest. I can't be on this. I don't. I'm sorry to say, I can't. How could it be? I don't like it. I, I'll be honest with you. If pornography was halal, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, 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 this if shouldn't be there because it wouldn't. In Allah, Allah But I'm saying, yeah, if it was allowed for me to do so, I wouldn't. Yeah, because it's such a, a horrible thing. Addictions and it changes the mind of the brain uh, of the human being. It's not the brain of the human being. It messes the chemical balances. The dopamine gets shot up, and then you go below the baseline. You, there's so many bad things that are addicted uh, attached to it that even kuffar are realizing it's problematic. But I'm saying things like that where it gives you... Do you know what it works like? Do you know in the casino where you have the jackpot machine, where you keep doing this, where, where you see a junkie, basically. You see a junkie doing that. And you're, you're standing outside and thinking, why is this junkie just doing this? And he's putting money in and he's losing money and he's just pressing that. You know that thing I'm talking about? And then the three things come up and he's doing that. The slots. The slots. And he's doing that. TikTok is like the slots. It's, it's, it's working on the short-term att short attention span, the dopamine reflex of the human being is just like doing the slots. And he's, he's paying a heavier price than money, time and health, heavier price. So uh, to be honest with you, something like TikTok or Yanni is uh, horrible. Obviously YouTube is different because you have a bit more, you can put an Islamic lecture on, you know what I mean? It's, it's a completely different situation. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, YouTube is haram on me, I'm a big YouTuber myself, that would be... <laughs> Imagine that I said YouTube is haram. Like, well, what are you doing on it, brother? But that's, it's obviously, I don't believe it's uh, haram or anything like that. But then once again, these are fiqhi issues that go back to the ulama of your time, uh, of, of your locality. You go back to them and see what kind of debates they're having. But frankly, you know what I'm saying? You try and limit that as much as possible. You know? And try and help your child through the addictions they may have by offering them alternatives. Sports is a very important alternative. Yeah, and it's a very, very important alternative. Extremely. Martial arts. People should get involved in that. You know, going out, you've got one of the most beautiful countries I've ever seen in my life. And I've been to 30 countries. This is the, the things I've seen in Cape Town. Wallahi, I've never seen it in any other place I've ever been to. The mountains, and it's like something you put on a screensaver. I mean, imagine you live outside those mountains and you're on a screen. But you know what I mean? Like... In, in London, I'm, in, I'm surrounded by concretes and stuff like that. Brutalist architecture, it's called. Literally because the atheist that, described, that made the, the, the name of the architecture, he didn't care about how beauty looked. He called it brutalist architecture. He's ruining the city. And you guys have got the most beautiful, magnificent sites. Take advantage of it. Get your kids out. You guys have got hunting. We're not allowed to use guns in England. But they're using knives, unfortunately. <clears throat> you know the situation. But I'm just saying, like, Annie. You can go and, and hunt this animal and do this and shooting range. Wow. I, I personally believe if it, if it was me here, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I would get a gun license. Now, you, you don't make excuses. If, if this guy's in that place that the white people have got, what's it called? Urania. They all got gun license, right? If they can do it, you can do it. You cannot let people have an advantage over you as a community like this. But it's long and the process and bureaucracy and stuff. No. Get the gun license. Every house should have a gun. Put it in a lock somewhere. Do something. And, you, and I would be personally shooting targets every week. I would be doing it every single... The Prophet told us. He says that certainly in, in, shoot, in archery is, is the quwa. Where Allah says in the Quran, وَعَيْدُ لَهُمْ مَسَتَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةً وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَوْزُ وَلَا عَوْزُوَكُمْ He says the quwa which means prepare for them with the strength and so on in Surah Tawbah. And Allah says about the quwa here, is that the Mufassirin say it's actually in the archery. Because it doesn't matter how big you are. I can be a huge guy. Little child brings out a knife and puts it in my stomach, it doesn't matter how big I am. Let alone someone shoots me from a fast sniper or something. It's finished. The strongest one in this country is the one who can use the gun the best. It's nothing to do with MMA or this or that, Yani. If you're, if you're allowed to, use, if it's legal for you to use guns, 
and you don't have a gun, you've disadvantaged yourself in a way that I can't, I, I actually can't believe it. I'm shocked by it. You have to go shooting to teach your child how to, because look at what the violence here, so to say. That is one of the disadvantages. In London, we have it. In Cape Town, we have it. Which means that if you want your child to be safe that, and you want your child to be healthy, you have to teach them how to fight and you have to teach them how to hold weapons which are legal for you to hold in this country through licenses or otherwise. And everyone must make an effort with this. How? How can you? Look, if it was a situation where some communities have it and some don't, you, I, I, it boggles my mind. That people in America, some of them, they don't want to do this. And some people, you have to do it. This is my... So instead of, we give them a replacement. And it's an exhilarating replacement. Shooting guns. And why play Call of Duty when you can actually shoot a gun? In Very interesting. You've got to handle a real gun. Wow. Yani, most British people have never seen a gun in real life. That is a fact. They've never seen it. If you show them the gun like that, they'll be like this. They'll never touch because it's, it's, it's shocking to the British guy. You guys have an advantage. So take all those advantages and, and use them. Hunting, shooting, this and that. Beautiful, beautiful uh, country. Honestly, it's such a beautiful country. One more question, guys. Should we go to the sisters? Let's go to the sisters. And maybe I'll give you... I don't want to disappoint the brother. Let's go to the sisters. You've already had the question. Yes, sir. Um. Another question is, um, as you have very strong views on um, marriage in the household and um, household relationships. I want to hear her. I want to hear her. Uh, can yes. you comment on um, respect with between the husband and the wife? Within the okay, husband? I think it's good that you asked that question. No, honestly, you have to. No, this is a good point. She's asking about the respect that you require between husband and wife. And to be honest with you, I had a conversation with my wife. Now, when I say that, I always think that something bad is going to come out of my mouth and I'm going to get in trouble. I said, listen, you know I would die for you, yes? She goes, yes, but you would die for any woman. That's what she said. And I thought about it, and she, there was an element of truth in that. Like, if I saw a woman being assaulted, any Muslim woman, I would go and defend it. I have to. Like, otherwise, I would never be able to live with myself. I'm sure most of the men here would feel the same way. If you saw a, a vulnerable Muslim sister being harmed, we would put our own life in there. That's it. We, did, we sacrifice. If we die, we die. Because that's what, that's what it is. But I said to her, there's a difference, though. She said, what's the difference? I said, I would die to protect another woman. But I would die for the honor of my wife. That's a difference. And this is not an overstatement. If someone dishonored my wife or my, ch my daughters or my mother or my sisters or anybody... If they dishonored them in a way which I thought was too much, I would risk my life for the matter. I would. If, if it came down to it, it would be like this. And I don't want to be tested with this statement. But such is the placement that we give to our wives in Islam. It should be like that. If war started in Islam due to the fact that women's rights and honor was desecrated. Like there was a famous war with the Jewish tribe due to the fact that one particular a rogue Jewish person, he tried to take the clothes off a woman. The whole war started. All the Muslim men got involved, and there was a war. And I'm forgetting whether it was Benu Qurayta or Benu Qaynuqa. I think it was Benu Qaynuqa. Qaynuqa. Benu Qaynuqa, that, that whole war started because of this. Because the woman's clothes were ripped off her body. The Muslim men could not tolerate that at all. It wasn't, she wasn't stabbed, she wasn't killed. She was being sexually assaulted. And it wasn't even rape. Yani, it was just the clothes were being ripped off and stuff like that. But that was enough for a whole group of men to say, no, no, don't ever do this. So what I'm saying is that the respect and the honor, that's really and truly, if we didn't give them that respect and we give, didn't give them that honor, they wouldn't do anything for us. Moreover, if you're not a loving man and a romantic man, an affectionate man, don't expect your wife to do anything for you. I'm not saying from a Shari perspective, obviously she's obligated, but she will not like it. You have to be able to show affection as a man. This is extremely important. The Prophet, he was asked, he was asked, who do you love the most? He said, Aisha. He didn't say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll speak to you later about it. I'll... No, he was, uh, he was flagrant about the matter. Because when you, let me give you a big secret. The biggest leverage that you can have on a woman is love. It's not money. 
يعني if it comes down to it money it's not the ultimate thing as what the red pill and this one say actually the main thing is love if a woman truly loves you she'll do anything for you يعني and i mean that not superlatively i mean that honestly she'll be completely loyal to you but you have it's difficult to give love if you if give love if you're not receiving it so one of your greatest weapons as a man is to give love and romantic relationship with your wife respect is not enough actually Love is important. You have to be. It doesn't take away from your manhood to show complete affection to your wife. Joke around with her, play with her. The evidence of that is the Prophet ﷺ when he spoke to Jabir, he said, and he, he said to him, "Why don't you marry a younger woman?" So you play around with her, and she plays around with you. Meaning what? You should be playing around with your wife. I don't get too many eggs. <laughs> But even that, you have to. You have to make sure she's satisfied in all ways. Once you fulfill that criterion, you'll be surprised. You'll be willing to do. Let me give an example. Look, if someone start bossing you around, right? As a as a as a human being, someone start bossing you around. So they go go there, go there, do this, do that. You see, like it was what brother uh, Oasis doing with me. You got a lecture in the morning. You got a lecture in the evening. I say, got oh, six lectures in a day. Do we? Oh, it's time to eat, and I put the food. In. Oh, it's time to go for the next lecture. But I just need to go to the toilet. No. The people are waiting, <laughs> but I might, I might, something might happen. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm, I'm, that was an exaggeration. But I'm saying, if if someone is giving you so much difficulty, I'm, I'm just saying, but is not generous with you, is not hospitable with you, is not a general. There's no malice in their heart. You can see they're coming from a good place. You can see they're doing it for the team. You you can see it's not gratuitous. It's not just so you can put her in her place and harm her. It's because you're trying to elevate the entire family and team. So you, if you want that, just like mashallah, they've been so hospitable with me. I started with this and I'm ending with this, and they've been so generous. So anything they say, like you've, as the Muhtarabi says, it enter akram tal karima malaktahu. That's it. They've got me now. They can do, tell me whatever they do. I'll do. They've got me now. But it's, it's with the wife. If you show her that love, you show her that respect, you show her that honor, you show her that affection. You'll see what she shows you, because a woman, by her nature, she's an affectionate creature. She, I, mean, I shouldn't say creature, but you know what I mean. She's extremely affectionate. She's extremely loving. She's extremely like this. She, if she's given love, it's the main currency. Because then, if she misbehaves, you can remove that away strategically. Now that's a different story for another. <laughs> no, but if you don't have any love, if you're not even showing affection, you have zero leverage. If you don't, and you have to really mean it, you have to really love her. So, love and respect. This is what I say. You give, and the Prophet ﷺ told us, "Istausu bin Nisa'i khayra." Be very good with women. He didn't say, "Sub, you know, subordinate them and submit them and coerce them." He said, "Be good with them." And with that, we conclude. And I'll be coming back, inshallah, Cape Town, definitely to see my family here. You know, of course. And I'll, I'll also all the elephants and the rhinos and, the, and all that as well. I'll be going to safari one day. And it's a beautiful place, honestly. Thank you so much for the hospitality. Uh, and I'm sure Hamza has the same sentiments. And if you guys need anything at all, we're in London. And you can send us and we've got our own institute, Sapiens Institute. Come. Everything is free on it. All the courses that we have are free. We don't charge any money for lectures or for even the stuff that we put online. So go ahead and consume as you will. Jazakum Allah khair. We just say shukran uh, to uh, our honorable guest who came all the way from UK. And mashallah, uh, may Allah take you from strength to strength in everything that you do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place barakah in that, inshallah ta'ala. And we hope to see you soon again here yeah, in this masjid. I see you guys are tired. And I just want to ask the community that if it's possible, inshallah ta'ala, just to let the brothers move. We can maybe shake their hands as, as, if they move past. But please don't block them because uh, we can. We know six lectures for the day, subhanallah. They really need the loo now. They need to go to the toilet, subhanallah. May Allah bless them. Barakallahu fikum salam. Just, just hold on, Brother Hijab. I've got something for you and for Hamza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Why do you forget that? What you need to do for the which you need to regard this God, but show why that is, why the divine is born in reality in the true one of us. In so many gaps, he gives the best explanation. What are the gaps of this? I don't know. They are all confusing. It's cool. It's like, okay, God. So we explain what you expect explanation on things. We don't know if it's really good there with an explanation. So don't forget, don't forget. They're like, oh, train can be explained in some way. Guys, we got to This case, it's like, so we're trying to try to excuse this whole sense of excuse. Okay, Kind of, I don't know, they might know how to connect with them. They might have this thing there. Why is here? They might have them. But the shaman party and the real party is right with them. And I'll party. I'm not this thing, I'm not this thing. But I'm not. I'll 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 make sure we can make sure it's I'm <laughs> 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 